Namaste from India. This is the way we greet in India. Namaste means I bow to the divine in you. So this opportunity to talk about Udaipur and Jaipur royal history. Before we talk about Udaipur and Jaipur, the sites and the royal past, these are the two cities which we visit in our tour of Golden Eagle luxury trains called the Darjeeling Mail. Before we go into their glorious past, I would like to tell you briefly about modern India and then take you back in time. Talking about India today, we are the world's second most populated country with a population of over 1.3 billion people. We are the seventh largest country in area. We are the world's largest democratic country with over 800 million electorate. As far as our land boundaries and water frontiers are concerned, in the Southwest, we have the Arabian Sea. In the South, we have the Indian Ocean. In the Southeast, we have the Bay of Bengal. We share our borders with countries like Pakistan, China, Nepal, Bhutan, and Bangladesh and Myanmar in the East. Our southern neighbors are Sri Lanka and Maldives, though we don't share any land frontiers with them, but they are our southern neighbors. In our tour, Darjeeling Mail, we start from Mumbai, the financial capital of India. We accommodate our guests in the impressive Taj Mahal Hotel in Mumbai for two nights. Then we board the luxury train in Odyssey, and our first destination is Udaipur, which is in the south of the state of Rajasthan. From Udaipur, we take you to Jaipur, which is the state capital of Rajasthan. And from Jaipur, we take you to the national capital, Delhi. From Delhi, our train takes us to Agra, the former Mughal capital. And from Agra, we take you to Varanasi, the world's oldest living city, to experience the most holy experience of the river Ganges and the city of Lord Shiva, the third god in the Hindu trinity. From Varanasi, we take you further east to the town of Siliguri, where we deboard our luxury train. And then we experience the Darjeeling Himalayan Rail. We stay three nights in a beautiful hotel in Darjeeling, and then we fly to Calcutta, which was the capital during the British time. So this is the route which we follow on our Darjeeling May tour. In the pre-independence era, that is before 15th of August, 1947, as you can see in this map, on the left side, the pink colored territories were ruled by the kings. These are the princely states. We had 562 independent kingdoms ruled by the Hindu kings who use the titles like Raja, which means a king, Maharaja, the great king. And the Muslim rulers ruled their territories using the title Nawabs. There were many Nawabs, but only one Nizam, the Nizam of Hyderabad. This is also the town which we cover in our another tour of India in Madras Mail. But when we talk about Maharajas, there were many Maharajas, but only one king used the title Maharana. Maharaja means the great king, and Maharana means the great warrior. And the title used was by the ruler of Mewar or present day Udaipur town. 
At the time of independence, the credit of unification of the country goes to our first home minister, Sardar Patel, who persuaded most of these rulers to join the Indian Union. He told them that if they join the Indian Union, they will re be remembered as India's partners in its freedom struggle. He promised them that they can use their titles in the post-independence era and the government of India would be having privy purses for them. But in 1971, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, the then prime minister, got an amendment and did away with the privy purses and abolished their titles. So in modern day India, if we talk about, officially speaking, the former royal families or their members are just common people but in their respective regions, they're still quite influential and treated by the local people as the royalty to this date, which we are going to discuss how these members of the royal family are still playing their role in being the leaders of the society in their respective regions. So on the right side is the map of Rajasthan, the modern day state of Rajasthan, but before independence, this state of Rajasthan was called Rajputana. And the word Rajputana is derived from a warrior caste, as most of you would be aware that Hindu caste system has four divisions. The highest being the Brahmins, the second being the Kshatriyas, the warrior caste, the third being the Vaishyas, the merchant caste, and the fourth, Shudras doing the menial jobs. So the rulers of Rajasthan claimed that they were from the warrior caste, the Kshatriyas. So talking about the royal house of Mewar, this royal family claims that it is one of the oldest royal families in the world with a continuity of 1,500 years. Going back to the sixth century, there was a boy called Guhil. So his mother, who was actually a queen, her name was Pushpavati. When she was out of her town, she came to know that there was an attack on her territory in which her husband and had died and their family had lost the battle. So she sought refuge in the hills where she was given refuge by the tribals called the Bheels. As this queen was pregnant at that time, she delivered a baby boy in a cave who was given the name Guhil, which means a cave born. So after giving birth to his baby boy, the queen committed Jauhar. In the state of Rajasthan, there was a practice of committing Jauhar or Sati, especially by the women when they were widowed. They would burn themselves alive in the funeral pyre. And this practice of sati was banned during the British era. But the last time a woman committed sati in India was in 1983. So this was an act considered an act of bravery on the part of the women folk, especially in Rajasthan. So when this young boy, Guhil, was around 10 years old, he was anointed as a king of a small territory by a tribal chief. So that was the beginning of this dynasty, the royal house of Mewar. Over a long period in the eighth century, the then king, Bapa Rawal, moved his capital from Nagda, a town which is 20 kilometers from Udaipur, to a flat topped hill fortress called Chittor, the picture of Chittor you are seeing, from this fort, they ruled for almost 800 years. But this was quite a history of struggle and the battles, many bloody battles were fought. Three times this fort was put under siege by the Muslim kings from Northern India, especially Delhi. The first one was in 1303 by the Muslim king Alauddin Khilji, who had heard about the beautiful queen Padmavati 
of Chittor. So he came all the way from Delhi, covering a distance of over 700 kilometers and put a siege to this fort and stopping all the supplies to the fort and finally sending a message to the king that if he's willing to give away his wife or surrender his wife, he would leave for Delhi and leave the kingdom in peace. But these fierce fighters, the Rajputs, refused this option and instead thought it is better to die than to be dishonored. So it's a very interesting story, the historical part of Mewar, that this Queen Padmavati, along with all the women folk and the children, burned a funeral pyre inside the fort and burned themselves alive. And while the women were burning themselves alive in this funeral pyre, the men wore saffron colored clothes. Colored saffron is the color of renunciation in Hinduism. And they went into the battlefield, leaving the fort walls, knowing that they are not going to return alive. So they all got killed in the battlefield. So finally, when Alauddin Khilji won this battle, he had no eyewitness to see his victory. So he was so angry that he destroyed most of the palaces and temples inside this fort once he conquered this fort Chittor. Two more times, this fort was put under siege in the, time, in the 16th century. So Chittor plays a very important role in the history of Mewar. And throughout the history, the rulers of Mewar and present-day Udaipur prefer to fight bloody battles and prefer to die on the battlefield than accept the rulers of Delhi who were mainly Muslims right from the late 12th century till 1857. They prefer to fight rather than give away their daughters in marriage to the Muslim rulers of Delhi. So that is why they are held in high esteem even to this day by other royal families of Rajasthan and the title Maharana, the great warrior is used by the kings of Mewar or Udaipur. In India, when we talk about the names of the cities, the Hindu kings, when they founded the cities like Jaipur, Jodhpur, the suffix Pur means a city or a town in Hindi language. So the city Jaipur was founded by the Hindu king Maharaja Jai Singh. And the city of Udaipur was founded by Maharana Uday Singh, whereas the Muslim kings use the, the suffix Abad, which means a city or a town in Urdu language. So cities like Ahmedabad or Hyderabad were founded by the Muslim kings. So it is very easy to identify who the founder was, a Hindu king or the Muslim. So this is the coat of arms of Mewar. Most of the Hindu kingdoms or rather the Hindu kings of India claim their descendancy from four dynasties as they call it, the lunar, the solar, the water dynasty, and the fire dynasty. The royal family, because in Hinduism, we have a pantheon of 330 million gods and goddesses. Even sun and the moon are the two gods in this big Hindu pantheon. So the royal family of Udaipur claims they are descendants of the solar dynasty, the sun god. So in this coat of arms, you can see the picture of the sun with the eyes and the mustache and the nose. That's a personification of the element of nature. So you have the sun god right in the center on top. A bheel, a tribal on the left with his bow and arrow who is honored because the first king of Mewar dynasty was anointed by a Bhil chieftain. On the right side, we can see a Rajput warrior with his full armor. So the coat of arms of Mewar, followed by one of the important kings of the royal family of Mewar, Bappa Raval, 8th century. In this picture on the right side, he's being seen being blessed by his spiritual master and the king 
is standing with his folded hands. His spiritual master advised him to worship Lord Shiva in the form of phallus, which you can see the picture on the left. And this temple, which he founded, Bappa Raval founded in the 8th century, is called Sri Eklingji Nath Temple, which is 20 kilometers from the city of Udaipur. So the rulers of Udaipur say that we are not the kings of Udaipur. We are just custodians. The real king of Udaipur is Sri Eklingji Nath. So they call themselves Divan Eklingji. Or you can say that they are representing Lord Shiva to rule the kingdom of Mewar as the real ruler of Mewar is Lord Shiva. So even to this day, every Monday, which is the auspicious day for Lord Shiva, the king of Udaipur goes to this temple and pays respects to Lord Shiva. Another important king was Maharana Kumbha. He defeated the Muslim king Mahmud of Malwa, which is in central India. And then he erected this victory tower, which we can see on the right side in the fort of Chittor. This is 120 feet tall and it took him 10 years to build it. And it is a very impressive piece of Hindu architecture. In India, by that time, we hear a lot about Indo-Islamic architecture, where it's a mix of Hindu and Islamic features in it. However, when we talk about this Vijay Stham or the Victory Tower, it is purely Hindu architecture we get to see. And the rulers of Mewar took great pride in protecting their religion and keeping together their tradition even to this day. Maharana Sangha, this was the last time when all the Hindu kings of Rajasthan got together under the leadership of Maharana Sangha to fight the first Mughal emperor, Babur. Babur founded the Mughal dynasty in India in 1526. He originally came from Fargana, which is in present Uzbekistan. From his mother's side, he was from the family of Ganges Khan of Mongolia. And from his father's side, he was a Turk from the family of Taimur the Lame. So Maharana Sangha, though he lost the battle, but fought a fierce battle with Babur and his army and got together this confederation of Rajput rulers to fight Babur. Maharana Pratap, he is the son of the founder of the city of Udaipur, Maharana Uday Singh. He is famous for his guerrilla warfare against the Mughal army of Akbar. Usually the commander in chief of the Mughal army sat on an elephant in the battlefield. And it was not very easy to go closer to the elephant because Maharana used his horse, whose name was Chetak. But here came an indigenous idea. Maharana got a special mask made for his horse, which you can see in this picture on the right side, which is like the tusk. Uh, sorry, the mask of an elephant, like an ele elephant face. So whenever the Maharana sat on his horse and wanted to go closer to the commander in chief of the Mughal armies, who was sitting on an elephant, the Maharana could go very easily because that confused the elephant, thinking that it's a baby elephant approaching it. Though he lost the battle in 1576, the battle of Haldigati, but certainly gave a big damage to the Mughal armies. So even to this day, he represents the chivalry of the royal house of Mewar. And in the city of Udaipur, there is a roundabout dedicated to the horse Chetak, and it is called Chetak Circle. So there are many uh, stories and uh, poems written on the bravery of Maharana Pratap and his horse Chetak. In the present day scenario, Maharana Bhupal Singh was the Maharana of Udaipur when the transition took place in 1947. The country, pre-independence India, which included both Pakistan and Bangladesh, were part of India. But at the time of independence, these two 
were divided as West Pakistan, the modern day Pakistan and East Pakistan as modern day Bangladesh. So Maharana Bhupal Singh, who was a very progressive king of Udaipur at that time, when Sardar Patel, the home minister approached him, he was one of the first kings in the Indian Union to join the Indian Union. And he was made, he was elected the Maharaj Pramok, the constitutional head of the newly formed state. And Maharana Bhupal Singh was certainly very progressive and continued to be the Maharaj Pramok for few more years. And he had no heir. He adopted Maharana Bhagwat Singh, who is the father of the present Maharana, Sriji Arvind Singh Ji Mewar. And Maharana Bhagwat Singh came up with an idea of forming a trust. And he encouraged learning and added to the glory of the Royal House of Mewar. In 1984, Maharana Arvind Singh Ji Mewar, the 76th Maharana of the Royal House, became the Maharana. And he now administers the trust started by his father. And a credit goes to him for promoting tourism to the city of Udaipur. He also owns a chain of hotels called HRH Group, which is in fact the largest chain of uh, historic properties, palaces in private ownership. And Maharana Arvind Singh Ji gets special credit for bringing tradition, continuing the tradition of the royal family of Udaipur to this date and making it a big tourist attraction. Something which was done within the family in the pre-independence era has now become a thing of uh, public domain. He has a big festival, Holi Ka Dahan in Udaipur city palace. Every year, Holi is the festival of colors and usually celebrated in the month of March. A day before the festival of colors, we have a symbolic burning of fire, which is a symbol of victory of good over evil. You can see on the left side, in the courtyard of the city palace of Udaipur, a huge gathering is there to witness this amazing festival. And on the right side, you can see Maharana with his family going around this holy fire and offering prayers and also giving a message to the people of victory of good over evil. His son, Prince Maharaj Kumar Laksharaj Singh Ji Mewar, is a young man, a dynamic personality who believes strongly in keeping up the tradition of his prestigious royal family of Mewar. But at the same time, he's a young man with modern outlook. He went abroad to Australia and Singapore for higher studies. When he came back, he took special interest in the promotion of tourism to Udaipur. In fact, it was his brainchild to develop an already existing island, Jagmandir, into a wedding destination. So today, Udaipur is in the international map known for hosting international conferences and is being promoted as wedding destination. Maharaj Kumar Laksharaj is always looking to connect with the people of his state. Here is an amazing uh, trivia about him that since year 2018 on his birthday, which falls on 28th of January, he has broken world records. This year, the Prince achieved the record title for most personal hygiene products donated in one hour in Udaipur, India with 12,508 products. Past three achievements have been amazing. Largest collection of clothes for recycling and donation. Largest donation of school supplies in 24 hours. Most people potting plants simultaneously. So these kind of things, he gets connected to the people 
and is quite active on Instagram as well. So this is about Prince Laksharat Singh Ji Mewa. Talking about the beautiful city and oasis in Rajasthan, because Rajasthan is mainly a desert state. But when we talk about Udaipur, the city of Maharana Uday Singh, founded in 1559, we talk about the beautiful lakes, we talk about amazing palaces. So here we can see three women on the left side sitting outside a colorful temple. And look at the colors, look at the women with their amazing clothes, lot of colorful. So it is also called Rangila Rajasthan or colorful Rajasthan. And on the right side, you can see a traditional dancer from the region. This is the view of the city palace. During the day, 22 Maharanas have contributed to the construction of this palace today. Some sections are the museums and during our tour of Darjeeling Mail, we take our esteemed guests to see amazing things, the amazing collection of the former Maharanas in this museum. In one section of the palace, the royal family still lives. Maharana Arvind Singh Ji lives with his family here in one section of the city palace. And it is an amazing property. Why? Because the foundation of this palace was laid in 1559 on top of a hill. So it's situated on the banks of Lake Pichola. This is the picture in the evening, which is so different from the picture we just saw taken during the daytime. City Palace in the evening time. And this is the picture of one of the sections, the interiors of the City Palace. On the left side, lower level, we have the Moor Chalk or the Peacock Square with the beautiful mirror mosaic work done by the local artisans. And this royal family of Mewar has been very enthusiastic throughout the history to promote art and uh, paintings, especially the miniature paintings of Udaipur region are today famous around the globe. And some of their paintings are on display in the museums outside India. On the right side, we see the picture of the colorful Shish Mahal or the Palace of Mirrors. Here we have the picture of the crystal gallery in the palace called Fateh Prakash. These are the crystals from F and C Oslers of Birmingham, England. In Birmingham, England, in the museum there, I came to know through my guests that there are only three pieces from the crystals of Oslers on display for the public viewing, but this is the largest collection of crystals from FNC Osler of Birmingham in the world. The interesting anecdote about this collection is that Maharana Sajan Singh went to one international exhibition and was so impressed by the crystals of Osler and company that he ordered a huge consignment, including the beds made of crystal, the tables, the chairs, and so on, anything you can think about. And when he ordered this consignment, and unfortunately, when the consignment arrived in India, by that time, Maharana Sajan Singh was no more. He had passed away. So the royal family had kept these crystals in one of the godowns in the city palace. However, we are very fortunate now that they, these are for public viewing at the crystal gallery in the palace, Fateh Prakash. You can also see the huge chandeliers on the left side and some of the artifacts on the right side picture. Crystal gallery at Fateh Prakash Palace, Udaipur. This is the beautiful picture, the summer palace of the Maharanas, which is now a hotel. The property still belongs to the royal family of Udaipur, but managed by the Taj group of hotels. We take a boat ride on Lake Pichola, which is an amazing experience. Gangor Ghat. Gangor is a festival celebrated in Rajasthan in the month of March by married women. They pray to Lord Shiva and his wife Parvati for the long life of their husbands. 
and ghat is the bank of the lake or the river so in this case this gangor ghat is the ghat on the bank of lake pichola now from udaipur we take you to jaipur the state capital of rajasthan but before the city of jaipur was founded in 1727 the rulers of jaipur ruled from amer or the amber fort which we know about today as far as the dynasty is concerned there was a clan called kachwahas which defeated another clan meenas somewhere in the 11th century until date kachwaha is the dynasty of the modern of the present royal family of jaipur the fort picture which you are seeing this fort was built in the 16th century and successive maharajas kept on adding more palaces to this fort so they used this fort from 16th century till 1727 and once the city of jaipur was built they moved their capital to jaipur which is also famous as the pink city of india so at the base of this fort you can see there is a lake called lake mauta which is a man made lake and the royal house of jaipur is one of the richest royal families in india so here is an interesting contrast between the royal family of mewar and the royal family of amber is or amer is that while the rulers of mewar fought the battles with the mighty muslim kings of delhi and much later with the moguls who ruled the big portion of the country whereas the royal family of amer had a marriage alliance with the third mogul emperor akbar they gave their daughter in marriage princess jodabai to the mogul emperor akbar which was a very good political decision for this royal family as raja man singh of amber he got the position of commander in chief of the mogul armies and whenever he would go on a conquest on the behalf of the moguls and return victorious he was richly rewarded and with the wealth they accumulated they built their beautiful and impressive amber fort raja man singh the first he was the commander in chief of the mogul army so when i was talking about maharana pratap of udaipur and i was telling you about the story of commander in chief of the mogul army sitting on an elephant it was raja man singh the first who was sitting on that elephant which was attacked by maharana pratap in that historical battle of haldi ghati in 1576 Here we have the picture of Maharaja Savai Jai Singh the Second. You might have noticed the title Savai has come in. Savai means a quarter extra. So this title Savai was given to the Maharajas of Jaipur by the Mughal Emperor, and they added it to their original title Maharaja, Maharaja Savai Jai Singh the Second. so after maharaja jai singh the second who founded the city of jaipur the maharajas of jaipur started using the title maharaja savai and in this picture you look at the royal flag of jaipur which still flies on top of the city palace jaipur you notice that there is one big flag and there is a quarter of a flag extra which is done because of the title savai Maharaja Savai Ram Singh the second he was a very progressive maharaja of jaipur in the 19th century he also hosted the then prince of wales who later became king edward the 7th in 1876 when prince of wales came to jaipur it is said he ordered that the city be painted pink in honor of the guest and that's how the city got its name jaipur in fact the city of jaipur is the first planned city of india the whole city is divided into nine blocks 
and Maharaja Savai Jai Singh the second, he invited the people with some talent from around the country to come and settle in his new city, Jaipur. So business flourished. And even to this day, Jaipur is also called the shopper's paradise. When we talk about the beautiful carpets, when we talk about the jewelry, Jaipur is said to be the world center when it comes to the jewelry trade. And thanks to the vision of its founder, Maharaja Jai Singh the second. Here we have the picture of Maharaja Savai Madhu Singh the second. He went to England for the coronation of King Edward the seventh. And in the picture on the right side, you see one of the silver urns. He in fact took two silver urns with him to England, carrying the holy Ganges water. So he took water. So when I have guests with me on the tour, and when we have our guests with water bottles with them, so I tell them that one of our Maharajas, Maharaja Savai Madhu Singh, took water from the Holy Ganges to England. So he had no ear. He adopted a son of one of his relatives who was a nobleman from a town called Isarda, not very far from the city of Jaipur, and who proved to be a very magnetic personality. Maharaja Savai Man Singh II, who ascended the throne at the age of 11. In this picture on the left side, you can see him with his garter and all the decorations. In fact, the kings, the former kings during the British era were awarded these decorations. And in fact, the British also assigned them different numbers of gun salute. Like the highest number of gun salute was also awarded to the Nizam of Hyderabad and so on, the number of gun salutes were assigned to different rulers. On the right side, we see Maharaja Man Singh with his third wife, Maharani Gayatri Devi. He got married to two princesses of Jodhpur and these two marriages were arranged. But this was the marriage by choice to Maharani Gayatri Devi. She was the princess from Kunj Bihar in the eastern part of the country. Maharani Gayatri Devi was voted as one of the 10 most beautiful women on earth by Vogue magazine. Very progressive lady. When she came to Jaipur as a queen, she did a lot for the emancipation of women. She founded a school, which is still very prestigious educational institution only for girls in Jaipur city called Maharani Gayatri Devi Girls School. And she is a social reformer. And she also became a politician in the post independence era when the royal families had no role to play to control their territories because post independence, they merged with the, with the Indian Union. And in 1971, when Mrs. Indira Gandhi did away with their titles and privy purses, she was one of the one one of the royals who was very active politically and was a member of Swaraj party. And she has a record for winning an election with maximum number of votes. In 1975, 25th of June, Mrs. Indira Gandhi declared the state of emergency. And for almost two years, my country was under almost like dictatorship. Mrs. Indira Gandhi put behind bar over 100,000 political opponents. And Maharani Gayatri Devi of Jaipur was one of those political prisoners. And she was put behind bars in a jail in the national capital, Delhi. Here is an interesting picture. On the left side, a picture from the 20th century, Maharani Gayatri Devi with her husband, Maharaja, Savai Man Singh II, Queen Elizabeth with Prince Philip on the left side after a tiger shoot. And on the right side, you see Maharani Gayatri Devi with Queen Elizabeth 
in the 21st century. This is the picture of Maharaja Savai Bhavani Singh Ji, the eldest son of Maharaja Man Singh. He was born in 1931 and his father was so happy to be blessed with a baby boy that he offered a lot of champagne to the guests. The nanny nicknamed the baby boy Bubbles and even to this day, he is remembered by his family and friends as Bubbles. But he was a real warrior. He was a brigadier in the Indian Army and played a very active role in the Indo-Pak War in 1971 and was decorated with the second highest gallantry award, Mahavir Chakra. You can see him on the right side by our former president, Mr. Vivi Giri, giving the award to Maharaja Savai Bhavani Singh Ji. Maharaja Bhavani Singh Ji had only one daughter, Princess Diya Kumari. She got married and had three children, two sons and a daughter. But as Maharaja Bhavani Singh had only one daughter, so while he was still alive, he adopted his grandson, Padmanap Singh, as his son. So after the death of Maharaja Bhavani Singh in year 2011, the present Maharaja of Jaipur is 22 years old, eligible bachelor, a very handsome young Maharaja, Maharaja Padmanap Singh. But before I talk about the present Maharaja of Jaipur, I would like to throw some light on Princess Diya Kumari. She is an active politician. She has represented one of the constituencies, Savai Madhopur, in the state assembly. And presently, she is representing a constituency from Rajasthan, Raj Samand, in the national parliament as a member of a parliament. She is pretty active. She interacts with her electorate frequently. She also has a foundation by the name Princess Diya Kumari Foundation, which works with disadvantaged women and girls and is certainly recognized for her effort by UN uh, National Committee Canada, by UN Women National Committee Canada for outstanding contribution to women's economic empowerment. So now this is the picture of Maharaja Savai Padmanabh Singh. When we talk about these titles, as I said earlier in 1971, Mrs. Indira Gandhi did away with the titles and the privy purses, but in their respective regions, they are still highly respected. They are pretty influential and they continue the tradition of succession. So Maharaja Savai Padmanabh Singh, he, and his royal family is considered to be one of the richest royal families in the country with a wealth of over $2.8 billion. And this young Maharaja is again very progressive and modern. He is an accomplished polo player. He's a fashion icon. In 2018, he walked the ramp in Milan for Dolce and Gabbana. Look at his pictures. You can compare it with this him in his traditional attire, maintaining his age old tradition of his family and in his modern outfits. Talking about his city today, Jaipur, the pink city of India is the state capital of Rajasthan, pretty busy. You can see elephant on the street and the holy cows have the right of way in my country. We have the camel, which is the ship of the desert. The bullock carts are still an important mode of transportation in rural India. This is an impressive monument, an, an iconic facade called Hava Mahal or Palace of Winds, built in 1799 by the then Maharaja, Maharaja Pratap Singh, for the royal ladies with 900 apertures in this facade, they could see the beautiful colorful processions taking place on the streets without being seen. This is called Hava Mahal 
or Palace of Wales. This is the picture of Amber Fort with the Lake Mauta in the forefront. So this, there are two more impressive buildings built by Maharaja Jai Singh, Jantar Mantar or the Observatory. Interestingly, Maharaja Jai Singh was a very knowledgeable person. He had great interest in astronomy, but Indians and Hindus in particular have a strong belief in astrology as well. So these instruments are used for calculating or preparing horoscopes. Jantar Mantar. Jantar means instrument and Mantar means calculation. So among the Hindus, when a baby is born, we take down the time of birth, we take down the place of birth, and we go to an astrologer, and he prepares the astrological chart called Janam Patri or horoscope according to the time of birth and date of birth. A baby born at this hour in Delhi will have a different horoscope than a baby born in London at this hour. So it all to do with astrology, which Maharana Jai Singh II had a great faith in. So the city of Jaipur was built in a valley surrounded by the hills Aravalis. Here we have one of the impressive gates in the city palace. And if you look on either side of this gate, we have two marble elephants. These were erected by Maharaja Man Singh II to commemorate the birth of his eldest son, Maharaja Bhavani Singh, who was known as Bubbles. During our tour of Darjeeling Mail, we also give an experience to our guests of dining at the palace grounds of Rambagh Palace. Rambak Palace was the most favorite palace of the former Queen Maharani Gayatri Devi of Jaipur. And here I have a few suggestions for you if you are interested in knowing more about these two royal families and the royal members of these yeah. houses of Mewar and Jaipur. On the left side is a book called Maharana, the story of the rulers of Udaipur by Brian Masters. A Princess Remembers, written by Maharani Gayatri Devi. Then we have a coffee table book, Rajmata Gayatri Devi by Dharmendra Kamar. And another coffee table book called Maharaja's Resonance from the Past by Charles Allen. Along with these books, there is a lot of material to be read. But talking about India and not talking about movies, will not be justified. So we have, I have suggestion for my guests, the two movies, Padmavat. Actually, this movie came under some controversy when it was released because the Rajput clan, uh, Rajputs from Rajasthan felt that the queen was not reflected in the right light, but this will certainly give you a good idea about the siege I was talking about in 1303 by the Muslim Sultan Alauddin Khilji of Delhi of Chittor Fort. And in this film, they give you an idea about the Johar or the funeral pyre burned by this Queen Padmavati and where she burned herself along with 13,000 other women and children who were residing inside the fortress. This movie is available on Prime in UK and uh, uh, in the US as well. And Jodha Akbar is available on Netflix in the US and in the UK as well. So Jodha Akbar talks about the marriage between the Hindu princess of Jaipur marrying the Mughal emperor Akbar. However, it talks about a love story which we don't know much about in history books the love which developed between this Hindu princess who initially was not very willing to marry a Muslim king, but as it was more of a uh, political alliance. But these two movies are my recommendation to our guests to get an idea about the history of bygone era.
So this is about the Darjeeling Mail and Madras Mail. These are the two trains, which two journeys we talk about. And with this, I, I end this uh, information about uh, the Royal Houses of Jaipur and Udaipur. And I hope you enjoyed it. There is a lot to tell you. And I hope when you come to my country, Asia, to show you around and tell you more about my beautiful, colorful country, India. Thank you for your time. Namaste. Over to Natasha. Thank you, Mahesh. That was a fantastic presentation. And if we didn't have the appetite for travel before to India, then we certainly do now. I think you've been done a fantastic job of, of giving us an introduction to that topic. And I really appreciate the recommended resources that you provided as well, because that just gives us an idea of what we can um, what we can download or go and watch to, to explore that in more detail. Does it meet the real thing, of course, though? So obviously, um, we would love for anyone to join us on our Darjeeling Mail tour in fin February next year. So as I said at the start, we have got some time for um, a couple of questions and answers. So I will have a quick look at what we've got come through already. So we've had um, a question from someone who visited um, Udaipur quite some time ago, about 17 years ago, just asking whether Lake, uh, Lake Pichola was, does still have water in it. They said that when they visited some time ago, it was quite dry and there were, there were cows, uh, you know, in the, in the lake and everything. So is it, is it an artificially filled lake? Is that how it's sourced? It's a, it's a man-made lake. And I would uh, share my experience. In 2004, I went to Udaipur with my guests and it was absolutely dry. But in 2006, there was a heavy rainfall. And in one night, the lake got filled up. And uh, a year later, there was such a downpour that in the Lake Palace Hotel, the lobby was flooded, so they had to evacuate the guests. So it all depends on the rainfall, but at the moment there is water in the Lake Pichola, and certainly the whole tourism in Udaipur depends how much water we have in the lake. And certainly Pichola is the most important because of the uh, Lake Palace Hotel and Jagmandir Island, which we take around, when we do the boat ride, that is one of the highlights of our tour in Darjeeling Mail Pro. Absolutely. So it's very, very dependent on the weather, but that's uh, something that we'll have to watch out for. But let's pray for, for, for many rains, obviously, so we can continue our boat trips there. Uh, we had a question um, earlier as well. I know you mentioned that the royal families are still very well respected um, in India. But are they, how are they treated on a day-to-day -day basis? Are they still treated like royalty when um, they're out and about? See, when we talk about, uh, from constitution of India point of view, they would be commoners. But from the respect and prestige they have earned over the ages. So they are highly regarded by the people of their region for sure. And whenever they are attending, uh, you know, some important uh, conferences, they are recognized as the members of these esteemed royal families. And many of them, especially in Rajasthan, and I would also like to name one of the Maharajas, Maharaja of Jodhpur, who was anointed as a Maharaja at the age of four in 1952, after independence, when his father died in an air crash. He played a very important role when he was heading the tourism department of Rajasthan to promote tourism to the state of Rajasthan. And to the extent when they converted their palaces into hotels. So from tourism point of view, certainly they are very well recognized in the industry. But for common people in general, if you talk to me officially, they would be just commoners, but they have great respect in the society. 
in general? There's a question come through here, just following on from that, to say, obviously, there is a great deal of poverty within India. So uh, is there any sort of resentment from, the, you know, obviously the, the uh, poverty stricken population of India towards these very wealthy royal families? See, when we talk about India as a country, today we say poverty, more than 50% of our population lives below poverty line. But many of these kings of the past were very considerate of their population and they were liked by them. And many of these kings went in for social projects. But in present day context, when we talk about uh, whether they resent the wealth of these people, I would like to answer it in a different way that majority of the population in my country is Hindus, Hindus say 80%. And in Hinduism, we have one philosophy called the karma philosophy. It may sound dif very different to the Western mind, but the philosophy says that if I'm enjoying in this birth, it is because of my past good karma, that the past good actions I've done in my previous births. And if somebody is suffering, it is because of the past bad karmas. So this philosophy has in fact given a logical reasoning to the people in general, that if somebody is poor, you don't blame anybody else for your poverty. And if somebody is very wealthy, they don't give credit to anybody else. It is the karma philosophy, which plays a very important role in this thought process. But when this question comes to me in almost every tour from my guests, because when they see poverty, and especially when we visit the palaces, it's a different world altogether. You know, when you enter a palace and you come to know about the lifestyles of these royal families then and now, and when you are on the street, when you see beggars or poor people or whatever, a poor rickshaw puller pulling the heavy weight or whatever, but it is all to do with the karma philosophy. That is how the justification has come from this karma philosophy of our religion. It's certainly a very powerful philosophy. And I think that's why perhaps a lot of your tourists do ask that question is because yes, yes. sadly a lot of people don't you know, think in that way. And that is a very yeah. powerful philosophy, this philosophy to have. So uh, thank you very much for everyone that's uh, sent in their questions and interacted with us today. If you um, did miss any of the start of the presentation, then it has been recorded and a copy of the presentation will be live on our YouTube channel from tomorrow. So please do um, take a look there and you can watch that back at your leisure. So thank you to Mahesh for taking up the time this evening to deliver thank you. this presentation. Thank you, and thank you to all our esteemed guests for taking time out to hear me. And I hope we get to meet soon. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste.